hour, we can get started. Uh, Laura, you can hit recording if you, oh gosh, she was already recording this, terrific. Okay, hey everyone, thanks so much for joining us again. I have the great honor to introduce Jerry Katz. Now, if you've been around us for a while, you've probably met Jerry. And if you haven't taken Jerry's Voice of the Customer course, then you need to hurry up because just recently, Jerry retired as the vice chairman of Applied Marketing Science. And like everyone who retires and has anything to do with ISBM, they actually never go away. They came to us. So, um, so Jerry's, uh, I didn't twist his arm too hard, but I did ask him if he would please join us for this and talk to us about how things look different because certainly during this period of time, Voice of the Customer stuff has been different and there's just a lot of things. So he's going to talk to us about that. Jerry has been uh, with us for many years and he's the recognized authority in new product development, design of new services, process innovation, and market research. He has more than 40 years of consulting experience and led more than 300 major client engagements in voice of the customer, quality function deployment, and a large number of strategic marketing science applications. His engagements have uncovered a wide range of industries, healthcare, medical technology, and commercial and industrial products. Prior to AMS, Jerry had 12 years as management consultant in marketing research with management decision systems, five years in the software industry as a senior vice president of information resources, and two years as a vice president and general manager of image preservation presentations, a specialized marketing communications firm. This I didn't know, and I want to share it with you. I'm trying to find little tidbits for everybody. Jerry has been on NBC Today show and the Wall Street Journal twice. And I don't, I don't know what he talked about, but now I'm going to see if he can remember and tell us that. His outside interests are in music and education, and he served on a number of committee and boards. His lifelong interest in classical music and musical theater has made him Boston Symphony Orchestra and Tanglewood subscriber for more than 40 years. As a serious amateur pianist, serious amateur pianist, he once performed at Carnegie Hall in New York. It was empty. And his mom didn't know that when he told her the story, but he was at Carnegie Hall. He's also a longtime fan of all the Boston teams. And again, we're so glad to have you. I look forward to, to uh, hearing what you've got to tell us today. And I encourage everyone to take advantage of having conversations with Jerry um, during this, this uh, hour that we have. So let me pass it on to you, Jerry. I'm going to go on mute and video off. Okay. Lynn, you left out the word mediocre amateur pianist. Okay. Uh, I was never very good, but in fact, the story is true. And I'm actually going to touch on that in the talk. I actually did once play for 10 minutes at Carnegie Hall, sitting in the exact spot where Horowitz and all the other greats did. One of the great thrills of my life, even though it was an enormous professional mistake. I'll tell the story as we go along. Um, yes, I officially retired, but uh, being a fan of the Boston sports teams, I'm pulling a Ron Gronkowski here and coming out of retirement, I've always valued my uh, affiliation with ISBM. And so I'm continuing to stay active and teach uh, uh, for ISBM. That's going to last a good bit longer. Um, let's see, since this meeting is primarily about sales and marketing, and remember ISBM is primarily a marketing uh, oriented uh, organization, uh, I, want to, I want to share a revelation that I had early in my career that wasn't the slightest bit obvious. And I wish they made more of this in business schools because I had a, a good business school education. But while I always understand, understood the distinction between what we call the techie nerds and the suits, meaning the engineers and the scientists versus the sales and marketing function. I always understood that, but in their mind, they lump sales and marketing together. They don't understand that distinction. And neither did I until I'd been in the work world for a few years and actually got to see it. I wanna do this as a poll. I'm gonna show you two photographs, okay? Here's the question and Laurie will put it up. Which one of these is sales and which one of these is marketing? Okay, Laurie, why don't you put it up? So if you think the top photo is sales, click the first one. If you think the top photo is marketing, click the second one. 
And we're going to wait for a little bit to gather up enough data to look somewhat statistical. There was a hint if you were paying attention, but hopefully yeah. no, no one was paying attention. This is very fascinating data. There's, there's things are still coming in, hang on. Despite the hint, this is really fascinating, Jerry. <laughs> All right, we have about 82% in. So let's end that poll, Lori, go ahead, show it. Wow, 50-50, <laughs> all right. I'm not sure of your logic, but let me give you mine, all right? So 53 and 47. What I learned early in my career is that sales equals push and marketing equals pull. And let me explain that. Um, the salesman's headset, and I, I, as Lori, I'm sorry, as Lynn said, I was a sales manager for five years. The sales headset is that if I'm, if I can push hard enough and I say the right things, I can sell anything. The, the old proverbial thing, I can sell snowballs to Eskimo. They're thinking their effort will push the product. Marketing's attitude is, no, no, if I can make the product sound so attractive, and pull people, my God, the salespeople just have to pull out their ordering pads and write up the orders, okay? So marketing people are thinking, how can I pull people to me? Salespeople is how can I push the product toward the customer? Now, of course, uh, the, the, um, uh, the age old question would be, which is more important? Well, they're both important. Uh, in my early career, when I was working primarily with consumer packaged goods, in, that, in those markets, marketing tends to dominate because, of course, it's unrealistic to think of a sales rep standing at the shelf telling you you should buy Tide rather than Cheer. Um, uh, but in B2B, sales is, if anything, dominant and marketing growing in importance as the years go by. Uh, that's why ISBM exists. I'll tell you a little story from my own experience here. Uh, and this is about the piano business. I, I said the one career mistake I made about, oh, 32, 33 years ago was I joined a small boutique piano manufacturer in the Boston suburbs uh, called Falcone Piano. And we made grand pianos and they were terrific. They were absolutely a rival to Steinway and Bosendorfer and the others there. Um, and uh, this was the guy that started it. His name was Santi Falcone, an absolutely charming Italian immigrant. Women adored him. Santi was probably the best salesman I ever worked with. He was really spectacular and really good at it. When I joined the company, he said, and our sales force, by the way, was four people. But he said, um, uh, you know, I don't think our sales force is handling the prospect very well. We got to fix that. And so I started off by observing our salespeople. And my observation was the three of the four of them were really terrific. And the fourth one was okay. It, it wasn't really bad. Okay. I, my observation was there aren't enough people coming into our factory or our store to buy these things. And we had a very elegant store in downtown Boston. So what does a marketer do? Well, we got to get more traffic in the store. We got to raise awareness. And so my headset went to advertising. And uh, as a little startup, it, is one, it isn't like we had a lot of money. But I thought, what can we do? Well, we couldn't afford TV. I thought radio. Let's put together radio ads where Santi himself does the talking with that fantastic Italian accent. And what could we afford? Well, First, who plays pianos? It's not rock and rollers so much. It's jazz and classical players. And the only thing we could afford was weekend mornings on a local classical station in Boston, WCRB. And what we found was that for $1,900, we could buy Saturday and Sunday mornings, which were their best rated programs, and run the ad something like eight times in total or something like that. We ran the ads. What happened? Well, sure enough, we got a bunch of people coming into the store who had never heard of us before the ad. And doggone it, within two and a half weeks, we had sold two living room grands 
$24,000 a piece. And this is in the mid eighties. That was a lot of money. And I thought to myself, $1,900 investment, $48,000 in sales. I'm on to something here. It was about marketing. Unfortunately, I never convinced Santi that I was right. Uh, I left in frustration after about seven months. Uh, but I did have that experience, which allowed me to play at Carnegie Hall. So it wasn't a total loss. The story was that uh, a classical pianist, Malcolm Frager, was playing with the Philadelphia Orchestra. And he loved our pianos. And he requested one uh, for that performance. And so that's what took us there. And my little uh, tryst up onto the stage happened after the rehearsal that afternoon. And I never told mom that the opportunity, that the, that the auditorium was empty. All right, let me launch into, again, Santi thought sales, I thought marketing, that was the mistake. All right, let's talk about market research, which is my real topic for today. And uh, a little history about the market research industry. Um, first, the field really didn't exist much until around the 1940s. And frankly, the reason was the advent of the digital computer, because while much was known about multivariate statistics back from the Middle Ages, I mean, much of that was developed uh, by the Turks uh, in the Ottoman Empire in the fourth and fifth century, it was impractical to calculate any of that stuff until computers existed. And so the field really kind of took off in the 1950s. Where did it take off? Well, it started in the advertising industry primarily around consumer packaged goods. And ad agencies treated it as a value add, even though their primary skill was creative in nature. Uh, they're the ones who started off doing market research. Why consumer packaged goods? Well, I think because it was so easy to find qualified respondents and gain their cooperation. Of course, specialists started to emerge separate from the ad agencies the big market research firms mostly started in the 60s and 70s and, and were independent and frankly far better at it than the ad agencies. And of course it's exploded today. Um, however, uh, B2B always lagged behind, still does, although we've made enormous progress in the last 20 years here. Uh, why again, it's a whole lot harder to get business executives to sit down with you and do market research. Um, it's harder, wait, I have to lose that, sorry. Okay, uh, it, again, it's harder and much more expensive to conduct this kind of research. And uh, as a result, uh, you know, we've lagged behind. And uh, um, I can recall a time back in the 80s where I was talking with the head of market research for Dow Chemical, and he explained to me that his budget for the year was $175,000, of which $85,000 was devoted just to a survey conducted in secret by one of the big eight accounting firms, just so all of the chemical manufacturers knew their market shares. So uh, we've come a long way, baby. Uh, also, market research has never been part of the culture in business-to-business -business companies, and uh, thankfully, that's changing as well. Okay, so let me pose a question here. Why invest in market research? Why do it? I'm just going to ask people to respond either in chat or if you want to unmute and speak up, Lynn will uh, 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 speak or, or read some of the responses here. What, what do you think are the benefits of conducting market research as part of B2B marketing. Any responses there? Yeah, I think maybe you get rid of a preconceived notion of what the customer is looking for. Good one. What else? Data-driven decision-making. What was that again, please? Data-driven decision-making. Good, good. Confirm or deny hypothesis. Ah, that's a really interesting one. I'll talk about that later. Take off your self blinders. Hmm. Very good, very good. Gain a competitive advantage by learning insights that others don't know. That word insight. the same reports. 
right? Good. Uh, get risk lower and pinpoint opportunities. Understand that, why people make decisions. All right, good, good. I, here's my answer to my question. And frankly, you guys have touched on much of this here. I think the first one is in gaining insights. And that word insights is actually new to our field. We used to have a director of marketing research. We now have a director of marketing insights. It was always about insights. There are lots of areas where you want insights. First of all, who's our target market? And that usually involves some kind of segmentation. And the field of voice of the customer, my area of expertise is about understanding customer needs, which in every survey I've ever seen is the number one reason for new product failure is a failure to understand the customer's need. Secondly, messaging people really need market research. The idea is we've got to explain to people why we're different from their other uh, um, uh, potential products or ways of accomplishing something. And so we have to find good ways to differentiate products and exploit those differences. To me, the really interesting one is this last one, reducing risk. Market research is an investment you make to avoid expensive mistakes. And I actually have... Uh, um, in my own background, I, I said that I spent my first 10 years in consumer packaged goods. So that for me, this is a lifetime ago before I discovered B2B. But I actually had a very interesting, uh, uh, actually, I guess an accomplishment of something I'm very proud of here. Let me explain how it works, works, worked then and I think still works now in consumer packaged goods. Introducing a new product, you know, whether it's a dog food or uh, a cosmetic product, you know, a laundry powder or a, a flavor of soup or a new cookie or dog food or whatever it is. Uh, introducing products like that is very expensive and very risky. So what they've always done are what are called test markets. They always pick two or three cities that are alleged to be kind of typical U.S. cities. It was always places like Syracuse and uh, Columbus, Ohio and Oklahoma City. And you'd launch your product in one of these smaller cities for six months or a year uh, and see how it did. And if it did okay, then you would roll it out nationally here. The downside of course, was you were revealing to the competition uh, what your new product's about and sometimes they could beat you to market, but this was the safe thing to do. Test markets usually cost somewhere between one and $2 million and that's 35, 40 years ago. It's quite a bit more now. So a new market emerged in the 19, late 1960s and early 1970s called Simulated Test Marketing or STM. And the first entrant was a New York firm called Yankelovich who had their, uh, uh, it was Yankelovich, Skelly and White, their laboratory test market. And then along came a Chicago company, <clears throat> Elric and Lavage who had the comp system. My company in Boston developed the assessor system which came out of academic work at MIT Sloan School uh, about eight years later, Basie's came along out of a division of Booz Allen. Today, they're kind of the, uh, the market leader. But Assessor was really kind of the first real marketing science model that tried to do this stuff. And after we'd done a couple of hundred cases, uh, one of the founders of that firm was a fellow named Glenn Urban. Glenn had been my master's thesis advisor at Sloan, and he wanted to do a formal uh, validation of the model, which we did. And we were able to assemble data from 216 cases worldwide. That was a big sample size for something like that. Uh, and we wrote a paper about it. And in this is the famous paper here. Uh, and this paper got a lot of attention. In fact, we won a very important prize for that. It's called the William O'Dell Prize from the American Marketing Association. Uh, it was, it, the, the Odell Prize is given for the paper five years after publication that is viewed to have had the greatest impact on actual marketing practice. And so we received this prize in 1988. Uh, and here's what we talked about in that paper. Remember the basic idea is a, an assessor study at the time cost about $50,000. So we're gonna invest $50,000 to try to save a million and a half dollars of going to test market if 
if the results of the assessor test say, we don't think this product's going to succeed. Um, the model was shown to be, we were able to recontact, as I said, 216 uh, client cases and get actual market results. Uh, and, th and the market, the model was shown to be really quite accurate. Uh, but I think the part that got the most attention was this next question. What is the value of information? Uh, today, we call that ROI on marketing. It, our management is always asking us, well, if I invest more in marketing, what's the ROI? And the fact is, it's damn hard to figure that out. Here was a case where we were actually able to do that. And what we were able to show was that the expected value of that information, and this took into account false positives and false negatives. Right? And by the way, the big disaster would be if you killed a product that would have been successful in the marketplace. Because if a product fails, it only loses money for one year. But if a product succeeds, it's an annuity for you know, 10 or 20 years. So those are very expensive mistakes if you kill a successful product. But what we were able to show was the expected value of that investment ranged somewhere between $280,000 and $420,000. I think that's what won the prize. That concept of being able to evaluate the value of information was a real first in the marketing science literature. Okay, so I've tried to make the case here for why market research is a good thing to do. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, unbiased in that feeling, having spent my career in that. But the fact is, some companies are just better in innovation than others. We know this. Uh, the PDMA, the Product Development and Management Association, has conducted this survey for many years. Uh, it's longitudinal. And uh, one of the analyses, and, and by the way, the leader of this is our own Abby Griffin, who is active in both organizations. And uh, the analysis that she always does is to separate what she calls the best from the rest, the 24% of the most successful innovation companies, and try to ask, what do they do differently from others? And almost every time they've done this analysis, the most frequently cited differentiator has been the use of market research to, to understand customer insights. And so there's really pretty strong data that's worth doing. Now, a few quick lessons for you non-market researchers. Our industry is kind of divided into two types of market research. There's qualitative and there's quantitative, and it's just what it sounds like. Qualitative research is always about words, answering why questions. Quantitative research is always about numbers, magnitudes, how much. I find that consumer packaged goods tend to rely more on quantitative uh, uh, B2B companies more on qualitative, but there's really good use for both of them in both, uh, in both kinds here. And that leads to what I'll call rookie mistake number one. This is the why you're doing it wrong. I find that people confuse those two kinds of research, qualitative and quantitative. I'll bet there are a lot of you out there, and I hope I'm not insulting you, who've conducted a quote survey that you sent out to your customers and 75% of it were open-ended questions where the respondent was asked to type some text to answer the question. In quantitative research, it'll be questions like rank order these things or rate them on a 10 point scale or which of these two things is more important. If your, excuse me, if your survey is more open-ended questions, you're in the world of qualitative research and you'd be far better to do it as a conversation with the customer rather than some kind of a written instrument. Um, now, in the world of qualitative, we've got focus groups and one-on-one -on -one interviews, and there are lots of different flavors of one-on-one -on -one interviews. In quantitative research, uh, believe it or not, when I started my career, there were still door-to-door -door surveys going on in the United States. That's completely extinct now, although it's actually still the way it's done in the developing world, once you get outside the big cities, in small towns in India and China, door to door is still the way it's done. In our world today, it's mostly telephone or increasingly web-based survey. Now, I'm gonna talk about various uses of market research. 
And I'm going to put up a, uh, an icon, which I really nod to Bob Cooper, who will be speaking tomorrow, uh, one of our ISBM fellows. Uh, Bob Cooper, the inventor of StageGates, came up with this idea of a product development funnel. And every consultant has their own version of it. This is mine. Uh, but the truth is we're all imitating Bob here. The idea being that there's fuzzy thinking that goes in at the top and new product development is a, is a, um, uh, a refinement process where we narrow our thinking to come up with a good product out the bottom there. There are at least five places on this funnel uh, where market research can play a very important role. Uh, target definition, needs asset assessment, concept evaluation, feature trade-off, and prototype evaluation. And I'm not even getting into the messaging part at the very bottom of the funnel here. So let me go on and talk a little about this. All right, first of all, uh, segmentation. We all talk about segmentation. We all do segmentation. Uh, um, as, as a way of organizing a market in our thought, in our thought process. Who are we talking to? What is it we're trying to communicate to them? Uh, first thing I want to point out is in the world of market research, there are really two major approaches to segmentation. The first, the first is to hypothesize segments. So we say, my hypothesis is that big companies will see things differently from small companies, group A, group B. And then we use data to test that and try to confirm or deny it. The other approach I'll call derived. Here we just gather a lot of data and we use a statistical technique usually called cluster analysis uh, or discriminant analysis to let the data separate the groups. And then we go back and say, how can we describe them? So, you know, these are the people who think efficacy is more important. And these are the people who think gentleness is more important. And now how can we describe them? Are there, um, are there attitudes they have? Are there demographic differences, et cetera? These are both very valid ways of doing, uh, of going about it here. And they each have their own uh, uh, pluses and minuses. That leads me though, to what I call rookie mistake number two, using a segmentation that's more interesting than useful. A lot of the people that do that second method there, what they do is they come up with different groups and then they give them very clever names. I remember there's a terrific organization called Claritas that divided the US into, I think, 48 segments uh, based on almost any kind, all kinds of data you can imagine. And then they would give each segment a clever name. And my favorite one was Station Wagons and Furs, which referred to newly wealthy suburban uh, people, um, et cetera. Well, here's my little story. I was once at a conference where a, uh, a really well-known academic, I'll just say, we'll name him, but University of Chicago, uh, a, a really good guy, uh, showed a segmentation he had done on automobile ownership. And one of his big conclusions, which he was very proud of, and I thought was very clever is this, what distinguishes owners of Ford automobiles? He said, the biggest thing they found is if you stand in front of their house and many houses will have a big picture window in the front, Ford owners were three times more likely than the rest of the population to have a lamp dead set in the center of the picture window. And he said, this had to do with order and um, uh, um, conservatism, and, uh, you know, it, it just kind of went with the Ford ownership headset. It's a big auditorium of people. Someone in the back raised their hand and said, excuse me, professor, can you tell me where I can buy a list of people who have a lamp dead set in the middle of their picture window? And the audience erupted in laughter because the point is, while it's a great observation, what do you do about it? I mean, you can't market to them. You have to wait for them to come into the dealership. So sometimes I find segmentations are more interesting than useful. And I think you gotta be careful with that. Now, let's, let's talk a little about my own area of expertise, voice of the customer. And as we all know, uh, the field was originated by Abby Griffin and her thesis advisor at MIT, John Hauser. And this was the famous paper published in 1983, 
that kind of created the field here. Uh, there are some huge, and, and you absolutely can do voice of the customer yourself. Uh, you know, I was probably involved in 300 cases myself, but I've taught several thousand people to do it themselves. There are some big rookie mistakes that people make in this field too. It usually starts with people standing up. Someone will stand up in a meeting and say, okay, let's go out and talk to some of our customers and ask them what they want. Big mistake. There are two errors that people make here. One on the first line of that statement and one on the second. The first mistake I think is that they only talk to their own customers. I found, uh, and, and, and they talk to actually a very narrow subset of their own customers, the key accounts, the biggest and best customers. Why is that a mistake? Those are the people you talk to every week. You're probably doing a great job responding to their needs. That's why they're your biggest customers. And so I found in VOC, you learn a whole lot more talking to people other than your own customers, very average customers, your small customers, your competitors' customers, ex-customers will be more than happy to tell you why they left and why the other guy's product was more to their liking or solved their problems better. So that's one mistake. The other one is this rather subtle psychological thing. Ask them what they want. Here's the great irony I've always said in our field. If you want to understand the customer's wants and needs, the worst way to do that is to ask them what they want and what they need. Now, why is that? Well, what we found is the psychology of that, and I don't understand why. If I ask you, tell me what you want, tell me what you need, customers aren't very creative. And so they, they think they're supposed to tell you the exact feature or solution to their need. And since they're not very creative, what they do is they play back exactly what's already out there. And if you dutifully write that down and say, okay, the customer wants 600 dots per inch printer and this Zoom function, et cetera, and you come back a year later and say, well, here it is. They go, why would I want that? I already have that, okay? So it's the wrong conversation to have. Don't ask them what they want. Ask them what they're trying to do with it, okay? And their terms have been around about jobs to be done, about uh, desired outcomes. That's the conversation you want to have. Don't ask them what they want. So here's rookie mistake number three, only talking to our own largest customers. And rookie mistake number four, making the mistake of asking them what they want or need, what I call the frontal assault type of question. Now, I think there is some persistent engineering folklore that's still out there. And frankly, it's not just engineering. Uh, I want you to think about this. How many of you have ever uttered one of these three phrases? Customers can't tell you what they want. Customers don't know what they want until they see it. And by the way, Steve Jobs is alleged to have said this many, many times. Or no customer would have ever said they wanted a microwave oven, an iPod, a TiVo, or a smartphone. I would argue that that last statement is actually absolutely true. No customer ever told you they wanted a microwave oven. But what's the fallacy in that thinking? The fallacy is that in the world of innovation, microwave oven is not a customer need. What is it? It's a solution to a whole slew of needs. It lets me cook faster. Uh, I don't have to preheat the oven for 15 minutes. I can reheat my leftovers without drying them out. Those are needs. Microwave oven was just a very elegant technical solution to those needs. And this leads to the next rookie mistake, which is failing to make that distinction between needs and solutions to needs. They're two entirely different things. Don't confuse the two. You should not be talking to customers about solutions. You're gonna get yesterday's solutions. It's not their job to come up with the new feature or solution. That's your job as a product developer, okay? The conversation you should be having with them is what is it they're trying to get done and what makes it harder or easier for them to get it done. There's the famous quote here uh, from Henry Ford, if I'd asked a customer what they wanted, they'd have set a faster horse. And he used this phrase to, uh, uh, to excuse himself from having to go and talk to customers. Well, what's the fallacy in that statement? 
let's separate the need from the solution to need. What's the need? The need is that the customer wants to go faster, okay? The current technology was horse. The horse had probably been pushed to its logical extreme, its biological extreme. And so Ford came up with a better way, the automobile. Separate the need from the solution to the need. Don't confuse the two. Um, now, to do a good VOC study, one of the first things we need to do is to answer the question, who's the customer? And I have to say, uh, in, in some markets, that's really straightforward. If you're selling cornflakes, it's usually pretty straightforward. There's someone in the house who consumes the stuff. There's someone in the household who purchases the stuff, and it's often the same person, okay? Us folks in B2B aren't so lucky. Business to business markets are characterized by multiple layers of decision making, each with important needs and none of whom can be ignored. Uh, so for instance here, uh, I, I always like to say there are two extremes, there's users and there's choosers, but there's lots of people in between. Uh, you know, for instance, let's say you have a medical device, okay, a laboratory medical device used in a hospital laboratory. Okay, the end user might be a technician with a pipette who's actually running tests. The decision maker might be a PhD biochemist who runs the lab, who never touches the device, but they're the decision maker. Influencers, every hospital has these biotech engineers who fix things when they break, okay? They're not users. They're not decision makers, but boy, do they know a lot about what's going on inside that device because they're the folks who really have to understand and be able to fix things. Furthermore, most B2B products go through multi-layered distribution channels, supply chains, as we say. And so, you know, you've got dealers out there and jobbers and so on. These are all customers. They all need to be satisfied. And, uh, and understanding this, is pretty critical here. What I suggest to people is start with the end user and work your way back up to the manufacturer. And at each stage there, ask yourself, do I think those people have information that would be useful to us to develop to, in order to develop our next generation of this product? And if the answer is yes, you probably want to include them in your sample for a voice of the customer study. So rookie number, rookie mistake number six is simply defining the customer too narrowly. I find that in B2B, there's a tendency to talk to either the direct customer or the end user, but not both. You know, the, the direct purchaser might be people in procurement. The end user might be some guy working, you know, at the end of a uh, um, production line in a factory or someone working out in the field. Sorry, folks, they're both customers, and you really ought to be thinking about both. Okay, uh, here's another good one. Uh, in the Griffin and Hauser paper I showed you earlier, they give a formal definition for voice of the customer. And there's four parts to it. I'm going to focus on this second one here, expressed in the customer's own words. This was one of the revelations of Abby Griffin in her doctoral thesis research. What she found was there in almost every field she looked at, there was a tendency to want to take what the customer said and turn it into some language that's kind of more comfortable for us. And every company and every industry has its own terminology and its own three letter acronyms and so on. The favorite one I ever saw was in the airline industry when we were talking to customers and they were uniformly saying uh, that they hated the process of getting on and off the plane because they felt like they were being herded like cattle. Those words herded like cattle kept coming up again and again. One of the people from the airline wrote that need down as orderly emplaning and deplaning of passengers. That's the way she heard the need. The customer saying, I don't wanna be herded like cattle. The airline said, oh, what they want is orderly emplaning and deplaning of passengers. Well, sorry folks, you just made a big mistake. First of all, you took a customer negative 
and turned it into an airline positive. So if what you're trying to do is promote orderly and planning and deplanning of passengers, good for you. That's what's making the customer feel herded like cattle. Furthermore, I'm sorry, but I, I have never used the words M-planing or deplaning. I'm not sure they're real words. The industry, flight attendants will say, we're going to deplane through the second left door. But we, we never use that word. I'm sorry, I get off the plane. I don't deplane. Okay, so again, if you're going to use those words in subsequent market research, customer may not even know what you're talking about. So rookie mistake number seven is translating customer vernacular into company speak. Big mistake. Abby argues, try to maintain uh, the words of the customer as best as you can. All right. I'm going to digress a little bit here. Uh, Lynn wanted me to touch on this topic that I did as a webinar for ISBM, I think about a year ago, uh, about some recent stuff going on in academia that's gotten a lot of attention. Uh, kind of a history repeating itself. This was a doctoral uh, student of John Hauser's at MIT, a Russian fellow named Artem Timoshenko. And he asked the question, uh, he, he tried to answer the following question. One of the principles of voice of the customer research is that we have these conversations with customers, we record the conversations, we get them transcribed, and we do our needs extraction analysis literally from a transcript, highlighting needs uh, from things that the customer said. It's a very important part of VOC. Unfortunately, it's very labor intensive and frankly, kind of tedious. It's the thing that our staff likes doing the least, even though we learn the most. Uh, there's a lot going on in academia now around machine learning. You see it every day. And Timoshenko, as his dissertation, wanted to study, can we teach computers to actually recognize human vernacular, human text, textual data, and extract needs from it? And this is the paper, it was published in January uh, of 2019, that's gotten a lot of attention and something that we're now doing and is frankly is a huge labor saver for us, not to mention being highly useful for our clients as well. All right, how does it work? Well, first you have to pick the textual material you're going to use. You could use interview transcripts, but frankly, you could use any kind of textual material out there, almost any data source, social media chat, uh, product reviews, uh, other survey data, et cetera, wherever there's text, okay? And you have to train the algorithm. This is a concept. It's why they call it machine learning. You have to tell the computer, you have to give it examples of what Timoshenko calls informative versus non-informative content. You have to give it examples of what kinds of things represent customer needs. Then you actually run the machine and it's no matter how large the database, it happens in a couple of minutes. You get output, you can analyze, organize the data and voila, you got the same kind of set of customer needs uh, that you would have from uh, uh, reading all those transcripts. Very exciting. Uh, um, uh, it'll only get better from here and it's already quite good. What kinds of data sources have we tried using this with now? Well, as I said, product reviews, e-commerce sites, uh, open-ended survey data, all the companies that are doing those little three question surveys, you know, after you stay in a hotel room or use their product or, uh, you know, would you recommend us to friends for the net promoter score question? There are usually one or two open-ended questions there. And they have this enormous, you know, hundreds of thousands of responses. This is a way of going through it really quickly. Uh, online discussion forums, as I said, social media, that all kinds of user generated content usually works well, as long as it's rich enough and there's enough initial data uh, for the machine to learn. Um, why does it work? Well, it took a process that had six steps and usually took us six plus weeks and reduced it down to four steps to take us one to two weeks. So, you know, the rules in marketing are better, faster, cheaper. This is definitely faster and cheaper and it's about as good. Uh, um, so 
lots of excitement about that. Okay, another question that Griffin and Hauser tried to answer is how many interviews do you need in market research? And here's where uh, the political pollsters get into great arguments. You know, what's the confidence level, et cetera. Here. Well, Griffin and Hauser did some experimentation on the qualitative part a voice of the customer. And what they concluded was that 10 one-on-one -on -one interviews, and they typically last about 45 minutes to an hour, and it's one interviewer with one respondent for that time. 10 of those will usually produce about 70% of the needs. 20 of those will produce about 90% of the needs. And once you get up near 30, you're gonna be near 100% of all the needs. Now. They did their experimentation with a very simple category with virtually no segmentation. We found that where they're complicated categories, we usually bump these numbers by about 10. We usually say 20 one-on-one -on -one interviews produce about 70% of the needs, 30 produce 90 and 40 produce 100. Truth be told, most of our studies will end up with a sample size 30 plus or minus 10. But even if you were only to do 10 or 15, truth is you'd really identify most of the needs. Now, this was very surprising to the researcher. Why is that? Well, my explanation is that we all took statistic courses. I'm sorry, statistics courses. And what did we learn in statistics courses? If you wanna do the basic test of statistical significance, difference between a proportion, it's the good old t-test, okay? And when you do a t-test, I think we all may have remembered, you need at minimum matched samples of 30 people. So we have this group, 30 people, and this group of 30 people, and we're trying to say, are they statistically significantly different? Well, that's quantitative research, okay? This is qualitative research. There's no such thing as a significance test in qualitative. We, I think the researchers went in thinking, we're going to have to have at least 60 people in order to feel that we got a complete voice. And it turns out empirically, that's not true. What they were able to show in their experimentation is that it's quite a bit less, which is very fortunate for those of us in B2B categories because getting people to participate in market research is often not a trivial to do. So that's rookie mistake number eight, is confusing the necessary sample size for qualitative versus quantitative. In quantitative, by definition, you're going to need larger sample sizes in order to do significance testing. But in qualitative, you really only need enough to feel like you've got your major answer. And the data is saying somewhere between 20 and 40 usually accomplishes that quite well. That was a controversial feeling in the beginning of the VOC movement 25 years ago. It's pretty well accepted now. Let's go on to concept and prototype evaluation. Now, th these are market research tests that are done, frankly, uh, just as kind of a check to make sure that your idea for a new product is on the mark before you start spending bigger money. You know, ideation, ideas can be cobbled together into what we call a product concept, and product concepts can be turned into early stage prototypes what we wanna do is take them back out to the customer, get their reaction to it. And as I said, make sure that we're, uh, uh, we're, we're going down the right path here. We're trying to establish proof of commercial viability here. And if we're off the mark, we wanna to try to improve the odds. Now, this leads to rookie mistake number nine. And this is, someone alluded to this about, in the first question about, uh, talking yourself out of your beliefs if need be. Here's one of the rules of market research. If you think you already know the answer, if you think you already know the answer, don't bother doing it because you will hear what you wanna hear. I've always said that one of the important qualities to be a market researcher, uh, the, the most important qualities is what I call intellectual honesty with yourself, the ability to drop your preconceptions and hear what the customer is telling you rather than what you thought you wanted to hear. Human beings want confirmation of their beliefs. And trust me, if you 
if if you're testing three concepts, the winner will be the one you want it to be the winner. Mark my words on that here. Concept and prototype testing are very powerful things to do, and they're rather easy to do. But I think people misunderstand what they're for and what they're what they're good at and what they're not good at. So let me just quickly go over this here. Here's what you can learn in a concept or prototype test. You can figure out do customers understand your product or service. Since many of our products are have quite a bit of technology involved in them, there it's hard to even explain the product to the customer. And if they don't understand it, that means you're going to have a marketing communications hurdle to get over. Obviously, you want to know what aspects of the product or service that they like or dislike. They believe it's viable. Sometimes you can explain the product beautifully, but the customer says, I don't think that can be done. You know, I think you're dreaming. I don't think you'll ever do that. That's going to be another hurdle to get over. Here's a good one. How might customers want to use this product or service? There is a whole litany of products that were created with one use in mind where the customer ended up using it for something else and nobody, nobody anticipated that. And my favorite example here, how many of you know that Viagra was actually created as a heart medication? And in fact, is still used as a heart medication. It's the truth. The folks at Pfizer were trying to work up products that promoted blood flow within the heart. And as they went out and did their clinical, uh, uh, clinical trials, they started getting reports of this very interesting side effect. And the rest is history, as they say. They thought that's where the money is. They ran, they completely shut that. Well, they continued that trial. They started a separate trial and, and were big winners. Okay. But a, a, a concept test might identify that. Here's some things that concept tests are not so good at. How large is the market? It says nothing about market sizing. It's not a forecasting device. How many units will we sell or at what price? It says nothing about whether you can produce it at necessary levels of quality. It says nothing about technical viability, and it certainly says nothing about competitive response. So rookie mistake number 10 is just going in expecting too much, expecting that this kind of check on your work, the concept evaluation is going to answer all your questions. It's not. It's only going to help you decide whether you want to invest more as you move toward market viability. Um, conjoint analysis. Uh, conjoint analysis is a quantitative market research technique that's used to determine how customers make trade-offs between various features. Ideally, we'd all want everything, but we can't afford everything. So we make trade-offs. Certain features are more important than others. Conjoint was developed by two academics at the University of Pennsylvania in the mid-1960s, Paul Green and I always forget his first name, but Srinivasan. And um, uh, it's a controlled experiment where what we do is we show the customer different levels of different variables. The word conjoint was actually an invented word for the words considered jointly. And uh, the elements that go into a conjoint analysis is we talk about attributes and we talk about levels of that attribute. Uh, I'll give you an example in a second. So attribute might be how many passengers does this helicopter carry? And levels might be three, six, nine, and 12, okay? And we talk about offers where we give people, we show people combinations of different levels and attributes. We ask them to make a choice task and we run the, this choice experiment. Uh, how does it actually work? Well, it, it's usually done in a 15 to 20 minute online survey. It's become quite a bit easier now. There are some very good uh, software tools out there that have made it a lot easier. And each person might be shown 10 to 20 combinations of different levels and different, uh, att at different attributes and different levels there. So here's an example, uh, my helicopter, helicopter example. We have offers A, B, and C. Uh, offer A has an operating range of 500 miles, B has 450 miles, C has 300 miles. Capacity, we had six, eight, and nine. Acquisition cost, eight million, six million, et cetera. If I give people enough 
combinations like this where I keep varying those things, I can tease out data like this. And what we were able to show is, well, as you go from six to nine passengers, there's a big increase in utility. That is the customer likes it a lot more. Going from nine to 12, still pretty good, but not as much, but there's really very little increase in utility as we go from 12 to 15. Okay, so there's diminishing returns. And this, uh, this company decided to try to build a, a helicopter that could uh, had two configurations, one with nine passengers and one with 12. Okay. Uh, now, in each of these cases though, we have to determine what attributes and what levels to show customers. And these, this leads to my last two uh, rookie mistakes. First of all, using the wrong attributes and levels. A lot of times people guess what would be the right maximum and minimum to use. And it turns out they, they make a guess that's completely unrealistic for the market. In other words, why test 15 if no one, we, if we could know before we go in that no one would ever be interested in a helicopter with a passenger capacity of 15, we might as well not even test that. We're kind of wasting a degree of freedom to use the statistical term. And number 12, since conjoint has to be done online uh, uh, today, some attributes can be conveyed quite clearly over the internet. Others, you really gotta be able to get up close and touch it and feel it and play with it to really understand that. So we need to use attributes and levels that can be clearly conveyed over the internet, or we have to do our, our, um, our conjoint study live, which is, can, it absolutely can be done and is still done. It's just a lot more expensive to do it that way. If they can't tell the difference over the internet and you do the study that way, you're probably wasting your time. Okay, the last thing I wanna talk about that Lynn asked me to cover quickly is just what's been the effect of COVID on the field of market research and what has to change? Turns out there've been some pluses and some minuses. Happily, one of the good thing that's happened here is that since travel has been so severely restricted, we've actually find, found it easier to find difficult to find respondents. You know, one of the big problems you always have is you need to talk to this kind of person. Well, they're in Asia for the next 10 days uh, or you know, they're on vacation for two weeks or something like that. Uh, what we found is people have been kind of tied to home. And so recruiting has actually gotten a little bit easier. Now, uh, admittedly, I, and I've been reminded by this audience, we're all Zoomed to death. So it isn't like people have lots of spare time, but at least you're not going to be you know, away for long periods. Uh, and it sounds like it might stay that way based on our conversation this morning, even after COVID is over. So it's gotten a little easier to recruit. Secondly, actual interviewing. We used to always tell people, you got to do this face-to-face. -face. It's just a lot better to do it face-to-face -face than phone. But you know what? Uh, video conferencing is almost as good now. And I think this is going to stay. In other words, we can interview people regardless of where they are using tools like Zoom and Teams without having to travel cross-country or uh, across the, the ocean to talk to them here. And I, as I said, I think this is going to stay and will be a major uh, cost cutter. Third, I haven't touched on this, but there's a sub part, uh, a subset of qualitative interviewing we call ethnography. It's a fancy word for observational research. We learn a lot by watching people actually interact with and work with our product or service. And, and I mean, this is a, a, a field that grew out of the field of anthropology. Think about Anne, uh, Anne, Anne what, what's her name? L living with the natives. I almost said Ayn Rand. I don't think that's what I meant. Uh, um, and, and actually studying them. Well, ethnography, there is a field called mobile ethnography, which is would the customer be willing to set up a camera and let you watch them work with their machine or something for an hour. A lot of companies are a little bit queasy about that there. They're worried about uh, intellectual property leaks and stuff like that. 
Uh, if they'll let you, then you really can do ethnography remotely now, uh, which again will be a great cost cutter. This field has really bumped up quite a bit because of COVID. We'll see whether that's going to last or not. And then finally, based on those last two needs here, uh, the idea of uh, uh, concept or prototype testing or conjoint, where we have to show customers some kind of a stimulus. Okay, the question again is, can we do this remotely or do we have to give it to them live? Do, do, they, do we have to hand them a prototype and let them feel it in order to make all of that work? And uh, you know, again, it depends on your product, et cetera there. If it can be clearly conveyed over the web, you're golden. If not, you might have to wait another month or two until everybody's willing to have you in the door again. Okay, so just to summarize my 12 rookie mistakes. Uh, first, confusing qualitative and quantitative research. If it's lots of open-ended questions, you might, well ask, might as well ask them face-to-face -face where you can ask follow-on questions and gain clarity. Secondly, using a segmentation that's fun and interesting, but just not all that useful as a marketer. Big mistake, talking only to your own and largest customers real trap. I would not do that. And don't fall into the trap of asking them what they want or need. It just backfires. Trust me on that. Confusing needs and solution to need. This is the biggest mistake people make in trying to do their own voice of the customer work is they, they fail to make this distinction. Six, defining the customer too narrowly, only talking to one end of the spectrum or the other. Usually in our world, there's a combination of different kinds of customers, all of whom have good information and all of whom have needs that need to be satisfied. Number seven, orderly unplaning and deplaning of passengers. Try to use their words and don't make the mistake of translating into your own, you know, three-letter acronym or TLA, as we call it. Confusing the necessary sample size for qualitative and quantitative. Remember, quantitative, we're going to have to worry about the world of statistics. Qualitative, it's really just empirical observations. Nine, keep your mind open. Don't make the mistake of only hearing what you want to hear. It's a real trap that you are likely to fall into. You've got to keep an open mind. Uh, having unrealistic expectations from a concept or prototype test is number 10. Number 11, using the wrong attributes and levels in a conjoint analysis. And finally, testing attributes or levels uh, that simply can't be conveyed clearly over the internet. With that, I apologize for going a couple minutes over, but I'd be glad to take some questions. If people want to stick around another five, that would be fine. Okay. Great. Thanks, Jerry. Um, thanks for leaving that up too, because if you have to run, write down that email or the phone number and you can send your question directly to Jerry. But if you, if anybody would like to either go direct to voice or type a question. But that's, that was the complete end to end, boy. Uh, this one hour is what you need to let your team know that it's hard to do VOC without a lot of practice. But I love the idea of, you know, these are the rookie mistakes to look out for because uh, I think everybody, I can think of so many examples of folks who have just said, oh yeah, I could, I could talk to my customer. Um, and of course, talking to your customer today is very different than talking to your customer when you could sit with them. I, I do have a quick question. Great. Great, this is Jennifer Lindsay. Jerry, do you have any helpful advice, especially when, I think it was rookie mistake number nine, not just the rookie mistake within market research, but our senior stakeholders internally, how to communicate to them effectively so that they don't dismiss the data, especially in qualitative, as, oh, that's just a few voices and we can ignore those because they don't necessarily want to hear what they're hearing. Um, I'd say take them out back and shoot them. No. <laughs> Seriously, uh, I, I, I sympathize with the problem. I, funny story, when I was with that, the, this group from Ford Motor, 
Uh, it turns out choosing the colors for automobiles is a very complex process. First, they talk to color consultants and trend consultants and fashion consultants, and then they go out and do all kinds of quantitative research. And this guy was telling me he came into a management meeting and said uh, um, to the management team, here are our recommended 10 colors for next year. And one of the VPs said, eh, you know, that green there, I think that's just a little too yellow. I think we want to, and basically just torpedoed all those years of research. Uh, my answer to that is several. First of all, bring them along. Let them see the research. It's one of the primary reasons people use one-way mirrors for focus groups or record interviews. Let them hear it firsthand. Might not change their mind, but you're going to have a better chance. Also, when we report, lots of quotes, lots of quotes, you know, you, you, you put in the verbatim and it just gets a little harder to explain away. But, you know, uh, a, a lot of managers think they know everything and I, I don't know any way of stopping that. There have been times, Jerry, that I have equated market research and technology research and have said, you know, you, you wouldn't let, you know, an English major develop this new electronic device. Why would you allow someone else not do the marketing, right? I mean, it's just, um, it, 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 if you're not trained in it, probably you shouldn't be doing the deep level work. And, and yet again, it's an appreciation for how it isn't just a simple ask them what they want and then go make it, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, one other thing I'll point out is uh, um, a friend of mine who's a doctor is always talking about research and kind of dismissing what we do. Well, there's, there, there's natural sciences and social sciences. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier to achieve uh, precision in the natural sciences than it in the social sciences. Mm -hmm. Marketing is a social science. That doesn't relieve you of the obligation to try to do it. It's right. just a little harder. Yeah, it's much easier to get replicable. I mean, somebody can replicate the, the exact experiment in a lab with people. Boy, that takes a lot of people to get to the yeah. same, even close to the same level of precision. Yeah. Okay, uh, just a word to all of you that were here that Jerry is awesome at this if you didn't get the idea. And before you embark, if you have any questions, you should check in with them and make sure, right? Please do. And if anybody is, even though I'm retired, if anybody has an interest in doing any work, please contact me. I'll put you onto the right people at my old company. And uh, um, I, again, I've always said, there are certain things you can do yourself. There are others where you probably wanna hire a pro. And I'll be straight with you about you know, which that is. Great. Well, thank you again, Jerry. I really appreciate this. This will be recorded. It'll be available later. And um, I'm going to hit that stop recording. Thank you, Lynn. And we're one hour closer to the beer. Yes.